What's up, everybody? How are you? Welcome to another episode of Rocket Live. And I want to thank everybody who's joining us live right now. And a big thank you to everybody who will be watching the replay of this later on, as well as those who will be listening to the audio version of this as well, later on down the line. I want to welcome my very special guest. I'm really excited to have him on here, uh, Mr. Aram Arslanian. How are you, sir? I'm good, man. How are you doing? Good, good. I, I'm I'm really excited to have you on. I, um, As I had said in the, the post for this, that I had heard your interview. Oh, man, this has got to be a few months back now on uh, the Punk Rock NBA podcast, which, you know, I, I really like listening to Finn and, and his podcast. But that was my first introduction to you. And I hearing you talk, uh, I was just like really blown away by everything you had to say and like your background and the business that you built. So then I started, uh, I found you on LinkedIn and I was definitely checking out all your posts and then found your podcast and been really listening to that. And I was like, man, I absolutely got to have Aram on the show um, big time because I, I just think that uh, you and I can have a lot to talk about and and listening to you talk uh, and the thought process and your articulation and how you uh, bring a lot of knowledge and experience to the different topics that you talk about, I think is really cool. And it's a lot of the things that I talk about with a lot of people on my show. So that's, you know, definitely wanted to have you on to talk about the, the things that you're uh, a real expert and a specialist in. And a lot of that has to do with with mindset and, and being your best and tapping into yourself and communication. So welcome to the show. Really excited to have you on. Hey, thanks so much, man. I appreciate it. Absolutely. So let's get started a little bit. So your your company is called Cadence Leadership and Communication. Uh, you're based out of Vancouver. And, uh, you know, checking out the site and the things that you're doing as far as services, the, 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 the caliber of clients that you work with, uh, you're definitely working in a multi, a lot of industries. I mean, I was reading your bio and, and I didn't even actually realize how many different industries you've worked in, which is really great. Uh, I mean, everything and anything you, you've had a lot of experience with, which is cool. But I, I, I saw that you your your work, you started basically in the, uh, the not-for-profit sector. Mm -hmm. So you came up through there. Uh, so talk a little bit about your background and sort of how you started there with your counseling and then leading up to basically dealing with senior level execs and helping them. Yeah. Uh, so I'm a therapist by trade. Uh, I live in Vancouver, BC, and I worked in the mental health and addiction uh, area of social services for, mm -hmm. I think, just over 10 years. Uh, I started doing work out in Abbotsford, which is about 45 minutes outside of Vancouver. And my work there was primarily with street entrenched youth. So youth that would be involved in like the drug trade, um, uh, kids that would be vulnerable to being sucked into like really, really intense uh, lifestyle choices. Right. And then uh, I also did a lot of work with street gangs. So I did that for five years and then I worked in um, housing. Um, so housing for underserved populations. So people who, who find getting housing and staying in housing really challenging. I did that for two years and then I went back to adult addiction and mental health work for another few years. And then I just like, I hit a wall, man. Uh, yeah. And it wasn't like some big dramatic, like, oh, I hit a wall. Right. It was more like what got me interested in leadership and working in the leadership industry is uh, the absolute horrendous level of leadership and, and kind of <laughs> like the meat grinder of the social services and how people get treated yeah. as employees. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's interesting you say that because that is that is something that does come up a lot with uh, different people that I've talked to from their different industries is that exact thing of the identification of seeing things. It just isn't like it, it's amazing what passes for help and leadership in certain and you know you, you said it really well. There is this meat grinder aspect to it. There's also the you know the front of Hey, I am an expert in this, but really it's just sort of a, a veil and it's not real. There's no substance behind it. And, and it happens a lot more than people really, than really think. Yeah. And like the, the thing that I encourage people to think about is like, and this is, you're going to see this in all sorts of places. You see it in, in punk as well. It's like, there is a, there's a scarcity of roles at the top. Right. And so there's only going to be so many senior leaders in any kind of not for profit. And then if you think of a city or a province or a state or even right. a country, those roles are going to be pretty scarce. And the way it's structured is like almost like anything up to that point 
are totally disposable. And yeah. it's not for any bad reason. Like I, I want to like make sure I state that right up is that or straight up is that these are well-intentioned, like really in well-intentioned industry and industries that do a lot of super important, really, really incredibly well done work. But you got a never ending supply of really hopeful and caring young people that want to make a difference in their communities. And they'll mm -hmm. go in, they'll get paid like a bottom rate. They will absolutely work their butts off for three to seven years. Okay. And then they'll burn out and like they'll be left with like depression, mental health issues, and they'll be ground down because they saw way too much really, really harsh stuff. They didn't get supported by their organization and they were led terribly. And in not for profit specifically, like leaders are very rarely picked because of their ability to lead effectively and having like a good skill set, a good mindset, like really being well positioned. It's like they just happen to be the person who who's like withstood, you know, everyone else. They're like the last person who, who didn't get ground down. I was just going to say, and, yeah, last person standing. And it's like, OK, here uh, you go. <laughs> and uh, I've seen it time and again where there's these these people that like kind of really like you're, you're going to give this person a leadership of that team. That's wild. Like they're not. They're not a they're not a bad person, but they're certainly not equipped to do it. And right. then you, the next thing you know, you've got that person goes to the next level, the next level. You've got these people who are leading these like multi million dollar not for profits that are doing good work, but they're doing a lot of that good work off of grinding down these right. really well intentioned people. And then you see a lot of stuff like people who have committed themselves to working in that industry and they've gotten to a certain pay grade where they're getting paid a certain amount of money. And there's like the, well, what else can I do at this point of view? So there's a real, like not an all not for profits, not for profits for a lot of them. There's like a real like toxicity of kind of like staff feeling stuck in their roles. There's a little bit of like um, young people being like really, really ground down and, and starting with like such open hearts and then leaving with a bitter taste in their mouth. And then these people at senior levels holding on to these roles like, Hey, I make a six figure salary doing this. I know I'm doing good work in the community, but those people not having money, uh, they're right. not being invested into uh, become better leaders and just holding on to those roles. And in Vancouver, I could like name off the top of my head, like five or six leaders where I literally wouldn't have them lead a soccer team, let alone a multi million. <laughs> now, like really seriously. Right, right. And it doesn't mean the work that the organization's doing isn't good. Right. But the thing that I tell any, anyone uh, listening is like, if you have a friend or a family member who's involved in the not-for-profit, there's like the clear hard work that they do out in the community that like really open heart, good work, but also know that the culture that they're working in, probably their work culture is probably terrible. And they're probably suffering and carrying a way bigger load than you recognize. So that's what got me involved or interested in leadership work. Yeah. And I think that's that's really great. And you said so many key things in there, which, you know, really at the end of the day, it's it is that little bit of that last person standing and people are a little in over their heads. And while the heart is there, the skill set isn't exactly there. And then there's no one to help them to train them and give them that skill set to then be able to, you know, tackle the the things that they need to do to be able to do their their job, their their position effectively and make the right choices and right decisions. And it's a little bit, and like you said, it just becomes a kind of inherent into the system. And there's no, there's no development other than just kind of passing the baton. Yeah. Um, would you mind if I juxtapose that to the punk scene? One hundred percent. Because I was just gonna, I was literally just gonna. That was gonna be like my next question was was bringing it all together. So go ahead, you, you, you take it. So you got you got like people who put out these classic records, right? right? And like. Great, you put on an awesome record in the early 80s, mid 80s, late 80s, like 90s, whatever it is. And that's the thing that you did. And you've got this built in audience of people who look up to you because you made a record that was good at one point in your life. And maybe you made a record, right. maybe you made five records. And it's this like weird thing is that in like in punk and hardcore, there's only so many spaces at the top, right? Yep. And it's like, yep. and like nobody wants to. They don't want to share that space. They want that space to be them. And mm -hmm. and these people are treating like, and they, they're used to being treated. There are people who are used to being treated like these like deep, like, you know, like wells of wisdom. It's like, dude, get out of here. Like, why do you know better than some 30 year old or some 20 year old? You just put out a cool record at one point. Right. And that's like one of the things I challenge with the punk culture, like with, with punk and hardcore, it's like, there isn't like a built-in morality that's ba based on like super sound personalities. 
You know, yeah. like yeah. people get into punk and hardcore because they've been rejected. They've got problems in their family. They've got problems with themselves. Cool. Just because someone put out a good record doesn't mean they're a good person. And like, I've been burnt in that in my own bands. I've been burnt in that in my personal life. Yeah. Like, you know, I, I, I always grew up wanting to like look up to people because I didn't have like strong, um, I didn't have like really strong mentors in my life. Mm -hmm. So I was always like looking up to punk and hardcore people. And I have to say like, like nine out of 10 of those people, I'm like, yo, like that you don't have, like you put out a really cool record. I can't take that right. away from you, but like you really shouldn't be influencing people. And that's one of those things 100%. I got to encourage people who are listening. Like, Hey, if you're on a career path and you're working hard and maybe not even a career path, but you're just growing as a person. I don't think the first place you look to for is punk and hardcore for some deep in wisdom. It, you, you, there yeah. is wisdom there, but like it's a place to get introduced to ideas and right. then you deepen those ideas through people who actually like can provide that wisdom and that mentoring of those ideas and do that research. And most of all, like believe in yourself, believe in your self leadership. Sorry. Yeah. Pass it to you. No. And I, and I love that because you, you summed up a lot of things there and, and that's it. Like for me, you know, being involved in the punk and hardcore scene for me was was a the thing that I I look back at all these things and and it's something I needed at the right time because when I got into it, it taught me what I got the most out of it was the self confidence and the the self reliance and just the 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 fortification of the attitude that if I wanted to do it, I could make it happen and the power lies within myself and I have everything I need to do it. And being involved in the scene taught me that it gave me that self-confidence because I know that before that I didn't exactly have the confidence and it got me used to the, used to the notion of being um, comfortable with being uncomfortable, you know, starting bands, selling records, putting out merch, putting on shows that like, like doing stuff that I just would have never have done, but like being involved in that scene pushed me to do it. It pushed me to tap into my creativity and like not give, uh, you know, a flying F as, as to what people would think about it. And and that's what I needed at that time. And when I got out of that, it's what it pushed me to create even my first business was the self-confidence of like, you know, if I could do this, of course I could do a business, you know, and, yeah. but uh, but I did that. And, and then I grew and I grew and I still hold on to those principles and that foundation. But much like you said, I didn't just stay there. Like I, I do respect those principles and it's stuff that I teach people, you know, I repackage it as a different way, but it's, it is that sort of stuff. But I learned that there and then it enabled me to grow and develop. And what you said is an excellent point of, of this is a great foundation. It introduces you to these ideas, but don't stop there. Totally. Well, and like, I, I'll just say like punk is such a cool place to learn ideas. And it, I, I believe it's it really like, is. like, almost nobody can figure things out better than punks, you know, cause they, they, that's like <laughs> yeah. part built into the culture. You got a problem, get a punk on it, you know, that's like, it. <laughs> it and, and I love it. And I love the, um, the, I'm not going to ask for permission. I'm just going to do it. I'm going to figure yep. it out all of that. But there are some things like uh, Billy Rubin from half off in an interview a few years ago said something like, you know, someone was like, Hey, what's, what's something you've really learned in the past few years. And it was like, Oh, I grew up in punk thinking that my opinion on everything mattered. And I had to like <laughs> really realize that like my opinion on very specific things matter, but on other things, there's not like nobody asked me to, in my opinion, like it doesn't matter. Right. And that kind of entitlement of like my ideas must be heard in all situations is actually like a pretty toxic idea because like they're like way smarter people. There are people who, who like, who am I as a, as like, you know, a dude who grew up in Calgary, Alberta, middle class to speak on certain things. Like there's tons of stuff that I should like listen, learn. Punk and hardcore is like weird because it can give people this like entitlement that like you have the best idea in the room and that you have the right to like criticize and critique everyone where it's like, right. yo, there's so much to learn from people, especially people who aren't part of punk and hardcore, like get off of this weird judgment train you're on. So like punk and hardcore is like a really cool thing in it, it, like period, I wouldn't be anywhere right. in my life without it. Like I probably, I don't even know where I'd be. Um, it can hobble people and it can go from like something that helps you exponentially grow to something that can trap your development as a person. And like, if your main idol is someone who put out a record in the eighties and nineties and their main achievement in life is putting out that record in the eighties and nineties, you need to hold up a mirror to yourself and be like, where else can I get some wisdom? 
Yeah. Uh, well, well said. Absolutely. And, and it's, it's, it is that way because it's like, while punk and hardcore enables you, at least for me, once again, built the self-confidence and you realize, wow, I have a voice and I could use it. And you, and you realize the power of voice and opinions and thoughts. It is responsible. You need to learn responsibility with that. And yes, there are certain things when it's time to talk and use the voice. And then there's a lot of times when you should just sit and listen and really absorb what somebody is saying rather than just canceling them out or shutting them down or, you know, feeling like this sense of entitlement or pretentiousness because, hey, well, I came from the scene and you're not a scene person. So, you know, you wouldn't possibly ever understand. And it's like, oh God. <laughs> you know, I mean, how many of those conversations have you been part of? And you're like, oh, my God, you just don't get it. Like, yes, I went through this, but that doesn't mean because somebody doesn't go through it that they're that they're full of shit. Like, it's just not the way. Yeah, but like. How many of those conversations have I been a part of? But how many of those times have I said something like that? Like, you know, I'm not like, so I'm I'm going right. to be 47 this year. And like, oh, we're I, the same I, age. <laughs> all right. Well, I didn't come fully big like this. I had to learn. And like, yeah. one of the things I had to learn was like, success in life is going to mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. For me, mm -hmm. success is just being happy. Like, I just want to be happy more often than I'm not. And if I can do that, if I can be like, if I can be happy like 51% of the time and unhappy, and then like maybe not as happy 50% of the time, that's fine. Yeah. But like, there's so much stuff that like I look back and be like, damn, that was like ignorant. That was a ridiculous way of thinking. Like, yeah. oh, that was because I was insecure, like all of these things. And like, those things were true about me before punk and hardcore. And punk and hardcore helped with some of those things, but it also worsened some of those things and like that desire to fit in. Punk and hardcore is not going to fix that. It might actually yeah. make it a little bit worse. And like being harshly judgmental, all of that stuff. And so the thing I'd really say is like, I'm not speaking from any space of like, oh, I've always known this. I've learned this from my own mistakes. And like when I transitioned into like the pure business world, mm -hmm. I had the biggest learning curve of like, oh, this is how like most people actually live. And like these yeah. ideas that I have that I'm somehow special because I play in this because I'm part of this little scene, nobody cares. Nope. <laughs> but everybody cares. Nobody cares about like the entitlements that I that I think I have and that I'm the smartest person in the room and my opinion matters so much. But everyone's interested in the story. Yes. Everybody's interested in the perspective. Everyone's interested in the uh, skills I learned in punk and hardcore. And that is 100% what I've built my business on. Yeah, absolutely. And that's, that's very similar. And this is where we draw a lot of parallels as well because that's something that I... I, when I built my first business was very much rooted in that my, me and my business partner, we, we were both from the scene and we built this video production company and, you know, we lasted 20 years until I decided to exit and he's still going with it, which thank God, I'm glad he's keeping our legacy going. And I decided out of pure happiness that I wanted to do something else that would make me happy, which was to go into coaching mm -hmm. and teaching people how to like work on their personal brand. But all that stuff I'm doing is basically doing all the things I learned from punk and hardcore but like people are fascinated by those things and they're like, I don't know how you do this and I don't know how you do that and and all this. And I'm like, well, I'm ha I want to show you how I've done it and I want to teach you the ways that, you know, I've learned by making a ton of mistakes and learning how to do it better. So I'll, I'll cut the learning curve down for you a little bit and, and teach you some of these these strategies and philosophies and aspects. And, you know, I talk, talk a lot about PMA and it's like so funny when people are like, PMA, what is that? I'm like, it's just positive mental attitude. It's just a different way of saying it. And and uh, but it, it is great. And that's that's where a lot of the stuff comes in, in being able to talk to people, especially in the real business world and and executives and owners and entrepreneurs who want to learn how to do these things and are sort of on a roadblock you know they, they've hit so far and like anybody else like i've worked with counselors advisors coaches my whole career and i know what it means to get that person in who can unlock the next step for you the next evolution yeah. of your development yeah totally you know I one of the things that I think, and again, I, I can't speak in generalities about punk right. and hardcore and I, you know, kind of like moving, moving the ideas forward, like mentorship, having a mentor or having a coach, just, or even that person that just kind of like, like holds up the mirror for you. Right. I didn't have that. And in fact, I didn't have that for so long. And not only that, like I didn't listen to anyone and I didn't realize yeah. what a bad listener I was until I got hit in the face with like consequence of life of like surrounding yourself with like kind of 
surrounding yourself with the wrong people, like not holding up a mirror. And it was such a interesting thing for me because I, I really realized like I've been a coach for a long time. And of course, before that, I was a therapist. So I've been in the business in, in helping hold up a mirror for people, mm-hmm. but how much I, I didn't seek that out and probably actually avoided it. And if there's a piece of advice I'd give for anyone, business person or punk person or anywhere in between, if you have someone that you can find who's a mentor, and I don't mean like some ridiculous, like, you know, corporate mentor and not right. that that's bad, but like, that's usually kind of like a box people check. Yeah. Like more like, so like a real mentor, a real coach, a person who's like investing in you, or if you can be that for someone, that's huge. That is unlocking someone's potential. Let them get closer to that state of greatness. And that really matters. So if you've never had a mentor, you never had a coach and you don't have to pay a mentor, you know, and, and in some cases you don't even have to pay a coach. Like, get that because that's going to help you round out as a person and a professional for sure. Yeah, absolutely. I I fully endorse that. It's something that I was so fortunate to have very, Mm -hmm. very early on in my business to have met um, somebody who really took me under their wing, took me and my business partner both under our wing, under his wing and just showed us all. I mean, we, I went to school for filmmaking. We both did. And it's like, now all of a sudden, Hey, let's start a business. So, you know, the punk thing, let's start a business. Yeah. And you know, we had no idea what we were doing and he just took us under his wing. And he was the first person to give me think and grow rich and said, you know, the secret to everything is in this book. Like my father gave me a copy of this book this is what he told us. And he's like, and I'm giving it to you guys because the secret to everything you need to need to know, about life and businesses in this book. And he just proceeded to be that indispensable mentor to us at any time that we needed it, talked to us, told us all those things. And that was such a key pivotal time, like exactly when I needed it at the very beginning there. It was it was huge. And it does exactly what you were just saying. Someone that can hold the mirror up, hold you accountable, and really just show you and 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 talk to you about the things that you just don't know. Yeah, totally. Totally. Yeah. So I want to talk a bit about now about and we've been this has been a great conversation. I love talking all this. And but I do want to talk about your your company and Cadence Leadership. And so everything that we discussed right now is sort of is, is built into now what you're doing at Cadence Leadership. And you've built this really great company and you're working with all these uh, amazing people, executives, CEOs, C-suite, uh, all over, all from all these different industries. So let's talk about that in the company you've built, because a lot of this, everything we've been talking about is really the core of this now and, and how you've brought it all together and been able to like really amplify it with this company. Yeah. So Cadence, uh, at most basic form, what we do is help people like really get closer to that space of being great. And what I mean by that is like, you know, your day to day, you're surrounded by people who are likely consistently good and occasionally great. So like day to day, they're doing a good job. You know, of course, everyone's got a coworker who maybe is not that good, but most people are consistently good, occasionally great. And you know the difference when you're great, when you're like, damn, that was awesome. That was really good. And I just want people to be consistently great and occasionally good that you get up and you just feel like you really have access to all your skills all the time, like your really strong skills and right. that the way you're thinking is broad, it's open, like you can really look at things and get a really good sense, but also that you understand yourself quite well. And that work um, is what the company is all about. So we do individual coaching, team coaching, and then we also do like a lot of training programs. And our training programs can be something as simple as how to write a good email, which is really easy if you understand how to write. So you follow a structure, super easy, but most people write terrible work emails. And the thing that I encourage people is I believe writing is the most dangerous place for professionals. If you're not a strong professional writer, there's a good chance you're impacting your relationships every day. And there's a thing to think about every single time you communicate, whether it's writing, or speaking or texting or whatever it is, you're doing one of three things. You're either building your relationships. So you're building, you're improving on relationships or you're growing new ones, or you're maintaining relationships. The thing about maintaining, which is mostly what we do in our day to day, Mm -hmm. we could be maintaining great relationships or we could be maintaining really terrible relationships. Like think of those people you've worked with where you just can't figure out how to get out of this like difficulty you've got. Right or you're eroding relationships. So you're either building, maintaining, or eroding. One of those three things every time you communicate. And what I'd say is in writing, people are like, really, that's the space where people like consistently erode their relationships, either through just like poor writing, 
you're not thinking through what you're saying or like getting into fights through email. So like <laughs> our, our courses are, could be as simple as writing email, um, how to have a tough conversation, how to do a good presentation to much more complex things, like how to basically like create and establish like a strong working alliance with the team. Mm -hmm. So we do courses. Some of those courses are based on like straight up skill set. And so skill, like skills of how to do something. And some of them are based on mindset, like a way you can think about things. And then um, our team and individual coaching is all about like working again with a team, like right. stretching their ability to like work together, set the right kind of company culture, communicate well. And then where I spend most of my personal time is coaching, one-to-one uh, -one coaching. And that typically is with like more senior leaders. And that's like the, that's where like the big moves are. It's like, how do you develop a great company culture? How do you like really push yourself and understand your gaps? So I started the company four and a half years ago and I started it in a very punk way. It was as a reaction to something else. Right. So can I tell you how I started the company? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. 100%. Yeah. Go right ahead. Get in there. So the way I got into coaching was I was at a place in my life. I worked, I was working uh, in senior addictions and mental health and I was burnt man. I, yeah. I just like, I hit that point where I was like, I'm not doing my best work anymore. I think I want something different. And I was talking to my friend Thomas who lives in Richmond and he was telling me about, he was in this yes mindset. Like mm -hmm. if someone asked him to hang out, he wasn't going to be like, oh, who else is there? He was like, he was just going to say yes. Like, hey, do you want to go do this thing? Yes. And he was trying to get himself out of a funk. And it was like, you know, I'm right. just trying to have a yes mindset. And I was like, yeah, that's like a really compelling way to look at things. So I, I just adopted a yes mindset. And it was like a week later, I was walking down the street with my dog. I have a wiener dog. His name is Blue. And I, I come up to this light. And there's a couple there and the couple starts like fawning all over blue and they're like, oh, we love, you know, we love your dog. And usually because I'm a punk and like, right. you know, I live yeah. in Vancouver, I'd be like, man, you know, like real like <laughs> judgmental and kind of cold. Or yeah, yeah. <laughs> but instead I was like real warm and we were chatting. It ends up that this guy was like, well, what do you do for a living? I said, I'm a therapist. He was like, huh? Well, I run a coaching firm and we'd be looking, we want to hire a therapist to help us um, reconfigure our coaching programs. And I literally thought of Thomas and thought, you know what, I'm just going to say yes to this. So I went, did an interview, got the job. But the thing was, I thought I was leaving therapy to, mm -hmm. to go on this whole new path. But I got in and my first talk with my new boss was like, okay, here's your sales target. And if you don't hit your sales target, you're going to get fired. And I was like, oh, okay. I thought this was a coaching job. He's like, yeah, but like your main job is to sell. And, and I had no, like, I'd never sold. Well, okay. Right. Theoretically, I'd never sold anything, but I was like, holy crap. And right. this guy like tricked me into taking this job. So wow. this, and this is like a long story. I'll make it really short. Yeah. But I mean, that, but that is like, that's a big switcheroo, man. Cause that's like, Hey, come be a therapist and coach to now I'm, I'm a sales, I'm a salesman. That's, that's a, uh, that's tough. It was total. It was like the, what, what? Oh this, my God. I worked in this company. This is something about me. I worked in this company for five and a half years and it was absolute, the, the wo most wild ride. In my first week that I worked there, I had someone hit me on the head with a laptop case, spray perfume in my face. Um, oh my God. <laughs> the person who was the laptop hitter and the perfume sprayer got fired within two weeks, not because of that, but because while we were teaching a course at hotels, she stole all of the condiments from like, like hotels oh, bring in. I, yeah. Like, oh I can't even God. tell you how crazy this job was <laughs> and, and how ridiculous it was that I stayed there for so long. But <laughs> I, I, it tells you a lot about me anyway. <laughs> so I like have this terrible realization, like, wow, I've taken on a sales job and I'm right. selling something that I've never sold before. And I was like, I'm screwed. But I thought about it like, no, nah, man, I've spent like all these years selling t-shirts and records and CDs. Like I have a record label, like I right. played in band, like I know how to do this. So I started working in this company and they call themselves like a leadership company, but it is like the hokiest company. It is not, it's like a, it's basically like a public speaking company. And okay. the founder started the company. She is like the worst. She is such a terror, like super bully, toxic workplace, oh, like super oh. wild. And then her son became the CEO. And <laughs> this son, I can't even tell you. It's, it's like, like, it's like gone from uh bad to worse, like kind of thing. Like, right. But it was like, just 
a kid who had never had a job in his entire life until he started working for his mother's company. Right. And this, the the, keys. <laughs> and this is the CEO. He'd like never worked at like a fast food place. Oh my God. So I'm working with this dude and he's telling me how to run a business. And in my first month, <laughs> like I, I, you know, like right, right, yeah. on one level, I had never run a business, but on a whole other level, I run a ton of businesses. Right. Like, exactly. Your band is a business. Your record label is a business. Yeah. You don't think about it at that time, but then when you start doing it, you're like, wait, I was doing business. Like that's business. Totally. So I start working with this dude and he is the most clownish and he's still to this day, the most clownish person I've ever met in my entire life. Like just in, like, I could tell you so many stories. I'll, I'll spare your listeners. Right. Anyways. <laughs> um, one day he says to me, so I'd been working there at this point for about a month. He goes, Hey, your tattoos, I don't want the clients to see him. It's going to really upset them because we work in like really high end corporate work. So right. I'd like you to get specially tailored shirts where the sleeves are longer so that it will cover your tattoos. And don't tell anyone that you came up in the punk scene because they won't like that because they're like corporate people. They really, really won't like that. And, you know, it will freak them out. And don't tell anyone that you come from a background of therapy because they won't like that. It will make them feel like they're under the gun. And I was like, oh, damn, all I am is just a dude who's here to sell stuff. And and like I've right. been tricked into taking this job. And I watched this dude just abuse people, brutalize people, like like give people like crushing feedback in front of all their coworkers. Oh like gosh. it was so like, wild. As toxic as you can get. As toxic as you can get. And I get into my head, okay, well, I'm in. I've, I've taken the job, you know, I've taken the leap. I am going to work my ass off. And basically I spent the first two years there like outworking people. Cause it was like a crazy, like super competitive, like really like crazy boiler room, like yeah. bad vibe between people. Everyone's trying to get money and all this. Right. And I was like busting my ass trying to outwork the next person. At the same time, though, I didn't want to work in somewhere that sucked because coming from the punk and hardcore scene, I see something that's wrong. I want to make it right. I want to right, fix, you want it. To fix it. So I started working with one of my colleagues who'd been hired around the same time, who's like really ethically sound person. And, and she's now she's a, uh, um, a chief uh, people officer at a, at a bigger organization. So her and I kind of teamed up and we're like, hey, how do we change the culture here? And so I spent about two or three years just like literally taking everything I learned from punk and hardcore and applying it there while also being like, how do I bring my therapeutic practice into this work? So within three years, I'd become like the person who was historically the most successful, including the guy, the guy who like was the CEO. I'd like out, I had outpaced everybody from a sales perspective, but also I had built up this like new way of coaching within the company. And like, it basically, I became like undeniable within the company, but right. at the same time, I was super opinionated. Like, you know, I would like call things out if I thought they were screwed up. Like I was like really pushing on getting the yeah. culture better. And that worked for me until it didn't work for me. And what it stopped working for me is where like, I wanted the company to change in ways that was against the immoral behavior of, of the guy who owned it. So like the guy who owned it wanted to just be like a, terrible business person right, who just wanted you. to be it yeah and so and i'm also like painting myself as a saint here and that is not the truth because like i was also in this like really like i would say like morally bankrupt company like really yeah. bad company and it was having its impact on me like i became the worst version of myself well when you're like, around that kind of energy and those thoughts like that there's nowhere for it to go except into totally. you and then it just manifests itself out as you know those actions totally and so like totally like be brilliantly honest like I was like the shittiest version. Oh, sorry. Can I swear on her? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. You're good. You're good. I was the crappiest, a crappiest version of myself. Like I definitely, it was like the time in my life I became like the most materialistic, like the most selfish, like yeah. all of that stuff, like really just self-focused. And it sucked and I sucked and I was unhappy and I had become successful. I was making a lot of money. I had the corner office. I had like the VP role, all of that stuff. And I just looked in the mirror and I was like, I suck. I'm super unhappy with myself. I'm like picking fights with people. Like just like, I just suck. And you I'm start to happy. be like, who is this person? I, that's exactly how I felt, man. And in the next like couple of years, I try to like get 
get back to where I was and what I realized in those next two years. So it was around the three and a half year mark that I was like, I really realized I wasn't who I wanted to be anymore. Um, and in the next two years, I try to like work my way back to that. But the more I try to work my way back to that, the more I realized that person didn't have a place at this company. And in fact, that this guy who was this crappy leader had kind of worked a type of, I don't know, like mentoring on me, or I guess like he had bent me into a, a version a crappier version of myself, but that crappier version worked for that company. Right. And the version of, of who I am that where I feel is my best didn't actually have a place there. Um, yeah. But I realized like probably about the three and a half year mark, there's no way I'm not getting fired from this company. I'm definitely going to get fired from this company. Right. And so I just spent the next few years like building up my own practice, um, really like honing my craft. And I mm. never wrote down anything I ever did because I knew if I did, they would like take ownership of all my material. Right, right. Very smart. So I built a business within their business and I would have more than happy to like help them keep on a trajectory of becoming a good company. But it came to loggerheads with my boss and I was at like a really tough point of my life personally, like some, some stuff had unfolded in my personal life that was mm -hmm. really challenging. And I told my boss about it at the time and he told everybody on the leadership team, like all of this like really personal stuff that I had gone on for me. And we had a showdown about it. And I was like, hey, you did this thing. And he's like, no, I didn't. I was like, yeah, you did. He said, are you calling me a liar? And I was like, yes, I am. Yes. And then yes. <laughs> I was fired, like, you know, like maybe six weeks later, fired unceremoniously. But it was the best thing that ever happened to me because he called me up on a Thursday, fired me. I went and shaved my head, took a shower, mm -hmm. called every single client that I knew, said, hey, I just got fired. I'm starting a new company. And I left it at that. And, you know, I couldn't solicit people, but I could tell them I started a new company. And 80% right. uh, of my clients came with me. That was the bones of cadence. Uh, within the first year, I'd made two hires. Within the within two years after that, I had made, I don't know, like seven hires. And now mm -hmm. we just hired our 13th person. We work all across North America. Um, I feel that I uh, professionally, I have really achieved what I want to achieve, but I also feel like I tackled a lot of personal demons right. in that time. And that like getting fired from that job was kind of like saying goodbye to like a person that I didn't want to be and yeah. like, hello to a new person that I could be. Yeah. It was your catharsis for sure. You know, for it's sure. like you, you were able to like, like you, you even said it too, like, you know, you, you, you shaved your head, you took a shower. It was like really like casting this doppelganger version of yourself and saying all right goodbye now it's this new you know the, the person i really am mm -hmm. is here and this is what i'm doing and yeah. I, I love that well and also like because i'm like I'm, I'm telling him like this nice tucked in story like it could be like well, you know whatever but like i mean there's a lot of other things but I'll just of say, course like, i i grew up i went to catholic school you know like me too. i <laughs> i i i grew up in punk and hardcore so i was like exposed to ideas about morality but like man, you can work in a business with a really terrible leader and they can make you, and you can also make yourself right. the worst version of yourself. And I'd say in that period of my life, hands down, worst version of myself, made the worst decisions, things yeah. that I like deeply regretted, um, all sorts of stuff. And going through the fire that I went through in 2016 and coming out on the other end, mm -hmm. not only did I come back to who I really am, I actually developed a better version of that person, like more confident, more insightful, hold, uh, can hold up a mirror, but also who's actually well suited to lead people and, uh, and to teach that. So that's what cadence is, is founded on. Yeah. I love that. I absolutely love that. And that's, I'm glad, thank you for sharing all that because I think that it's really important because it does set up the context as, as to how you got from one place to this and how you're able to bridge that and show others see this is this is great because that's a great story it's that's a great story of leadership because true leaders know how to look at themselves in the mirror and look at that self and start with you first don't blame anybody else because it lies squarely on yourself and real leaders do that mm -hmm. all the time and when they don't they're not real leaders and so in seeing you got to see firsthand what a real leader is not like, I mean, you got to see what a bad leader is mm -hmm. and like textbook bad leader to like the point of like, oh my God, like, so you got to see that and witness that. And then it, you know, and now being able to say, well, a true leader does these things. And this is how you can really help people because you've seen how bad it can get. Um, and not just them, but how it affects everybody in the business mm -hmm. culture and how, you know, personally affects you when 
leadership is bad because you know unless you don't leave you're just you're taking on all that negative energy all the time right. and That's it right. only has one place to go which is back out and it doesn't come out good at all yeah so I think that that's really great. So thanks for sharing all that because it's really cool. Um, I know we're we're getting a little tight on time, but I want to talk a little bit more about uh, just some of the other things. So you have your podcast, One Step Beyond, and and I and I will say I have really enjoyed this podcast because I like the way you interview your guests. It's it's actually been very inspirational to me. Like I love the way you you get people to open up, tell stories. You ask really great questions, which that's another podcast episode I, I loved is the, how to ask questions. Um, you recently, the, the first one that I listened to was the Sherm's bagels one. Oh yeah. And I was blown away because I wanted to send that. I sent it right away to, to my friend who's in the throes of starting, um, a, uh, a smoke barbecue smoke business. And, you know, he was at a place, the place, uh, closed from COVID didn't reopen. So he's been, but he really wants to do it. So he's been trying to figure out ways to do it. And we've been talking about this, like, Dude, do it the punk rock way, to, you know, like how we would do it. And when I heard that Sherm's Bagels episode, I was like, you have to hear this. This is 100% you as to where you're at. And I sent it to him, and now he's like totally like, boom, he's he's making it happen. And uh, and so that was my first my first um, episode I heard. And since then, I've been listening to him. And even this last one, I heard the, the, the power of play, which was great because it made me start to think about like the things that I have been doing personally that i loved to do and liked doing and i've gotten away from them because i've been so focused on growing this business and doing all these other things that there's some of these other aspects i haven't done so it made me remember that so talk about the the, the one step beyond podcast a bit because it's these great interviews and it seems to me like in like kind of i don't know if supplements the right word but it, it definitely comes from out of I'd say all your leadership and what you're working on with your clients. Cause it seems to be a direct line to that. Yeah. So, and thanks for, thanks for all that. Um, one step beyond started basically like kind of inspired by something Finn from punk, punk rock NBA. And I were talking mm -hmm. about one day. So Finn is an old friend of mine and we are talking about how like people in the punk scene kind of like get trapped in this idea, like, putting out a cool record or being someone of substance in the punk scene is cool. Like that, that's, that's awesome. That's a great thing. But how people in the punk scene can get really locked. Like they're not thinking about their economic future. Like they don't know how to invest. They don't know how to yeah. save. Like it can become this cartoonish idea of what like life is because it's such a self-contained community. And I started thinking a lot about the people that I knew from punk and hardcore who were actually like really successful. And I don't mean monetary success. I mean like happy in life, have gone on to do right. other things while also keeping a foot rooted in punk. I became interested in that, but I also was interested in people that I feel like maybe they're not from the punk scene, but the way they go about leading their business has that kind of same attitude, you know, yeah. like that same, like yeah. you know, not waiting for permission. Right. So initially when I started the podcast, it was, I wanted to talk about topics. And so I started like picking topics and then I'd pick people. But to tell you the truth, I feel like I actually have just, now I'm a year and a half into the podcast, I feel like I finally just figured out what it's about. Mm. And it's not about a topic, it's about the person. And then as you listen to the interview, the thing about them becomes the topic, like right. that through line. Yeah. So John LaCroix, who uh, was in Tenured Fight and now has like a very senior uh, creative role in Walmart, his is like never give up his story is wild. And so it's, it's not the latest one. It's the, actually it is the latest one we just put out. Um, it's so cool. And we didn't start with like, never give up. It's just like, I was listening to his story. It's like, right. damn, John LaCroix is like huge heart. Like he went through hell to get to get stuff. And, and he, he put himself to like, to the test to do it. And so one step beyond I'd say is like stories from the business world mm. or people who maybe aren't in the traditional business world, but conduct business. So like right. we, we right. just did one with someone who's a, I'm an artist who built his own audience and he built, he's be able to create a career for himself as a successful artist through building an audience. And I just want to understand like how people did it. Like, how did yeah. you build your business? Like, how did you like get through this stuff? But also like, how did you build yourself? Like, how did you lead yourself or others? And the thing again that I, I, I want to put out to people, and I, I, I'm not trying to harp on this, but like idols, like people you look up to, like there's a difference in my mind between a mentor and a coach. Like a mentor or a coach would like find those things in you and help you hone that. 
Whereas right. like someone who, who you look up to an idol or wants to be someone's idol, it's like all your energy and attention goes into them. And right. you're only as good as what they give you from their perspective. I think like punk and hardcore is really set up to like for like idolizing people and giving people like false positions of like wisdom and influence where it's like, I really encourage people to recognize that like your own wisdom, cultivating your own wisdom, your own leadership, your own greatness, those things, that's your goal. Like don't sit on the sidelines and think someone else is, is incredible because they put out a record or they painted a painting. You can admire that. You can like that, but figure out how do you cultivate your own incredible stuff because everybody i don't care where you're at you have something incredible about you but are you cultivating it are you spending time honing what's strong in your skills are you taking your natural abilities and making them stronger are you learning are you doing those things and i'd say if at the end of the day if that podcast is about anything it's about putting around inspirational stories of people who have like cultivated that and that that story is what the interesting thing is hoping that other people will do it for themselves yeah, I love that. And I think that's great because that's that's something I, I do talk about a lot. And a lot of the work that I do with the people that I work with and coach, it, it a lot of it does start to center around like this version of a self-doubt and, you know, not being able to sometimes like really recognize that the real power that they have is in their unique experiences, their unique knowledge, their unique, and that's that's their power. That's the stories that they have because yeah. no one else has gone through what you went through. No one else has gone through what I, like you have your own unique set of stories, experiences, knowledge, all that that's unique to you. And that's where the real power comes from. And it's one thing to look at somebody and, and be inspired by what they're doing or be motivated, but yes, do your own thing you know, take that inspiration and turn it into motivation for yourself and realize that you're unique in your own way. And that's a power, not, not a, uh, not a weakness. Yeah. And like, when we're saying this, like, at least for me, I'm not telling everyone you got to fight for the spotlight or you have to like be waving your arms. Like, not oh, look at, at me. Like, listen, if you're good at something, invest in that thing. If you don't know something, learn it. Like there's no, okay. Growing up Catholic, I always had this idea that I was heading towards something that I would get after I die. Right. Right. Like the idea of heaven or afterlife. And like, I'm a, I'm a, I'm an atheist and I don't hate on anyone who has you know, a religion. I'm not, I'm not that kind of guy that's going to talk about that. The thing that I think stymies people though, on a pretty basic level is the idea of like afterlife. And even if you're someone who does believe in that, no criticism here, right. but it's after life, like life is done at that point. Why are you putting yourself on the shelf waiting for some great reward at some point? Instead, it's like invest in your life, invest in yourself, invest in the people around you, like build that stuff up. And when I started to really get keyed into the idea of like recognizing, and it wasn't really until I had a kid, like when I got a kid and then one of my parents got very sick, like within a very short time span, I realized like, holy crap, like my morality or sorry, my mortality Right. is like actually within sight now mm -hmm. and it lit a fire in me in a way that nothing else, else has in my life where i was like i need to make every day as good as it could be and that doesn't mean no bad days because like of course we have bad days that's life but like i gotta bring my energy to each day i gotta put my best foot forward and i gotta invest in myself doing that and having that kind of mindset means that you get to squeeze the most out of life make the biggest impact like make the biggest positive change and like feel good and the last thing i'll say about this because i know we're bumping up against time i have always been someone who like traditionally been terrified of criticism from other people like i've always wanted to like fit in with people and and like have a family because uh, i didn't grow up with a strong family bond and something i realized i'd surround myself with the wrong people it doesn't mean they're bad people at all but if you surround yourself with highly critical people or you put too much stock in the critique of other people, you're going to fail. I don't know anyone who's successful who hasn't surrounded themselves with great people. And when I mean great, I don't mean rich. I don't mean they have these title, these big titles, but they're great people. Being surrounded by great people lets you be great. Being surrounded by critical people means that you're going to have constant criticism from other people, but mostly from yourself. And I'd say like, I'm a strong believer in completely believe your own shit, believe in yourself 100%.
but also be totally willing to be told that you're full of shit. And what I mean by that is that like, you should listen to people's criticism. You should like to, and, but not to shake you off of your path, but so that you can squeeze every drop of knowledge out of it. But in that criticism, that doesn't mean like, listen to that person or listen to this person. It's that be smart about how you listen to people. Your worst enemy could actually have some pretty good criticism for you. And I would encourage people to digest that, but also be like, hey, this is coming from my worst enemy. So they're giving me criticism, but they're also like surrounding it with poison. Right. Take the wisdom and the learning, leave the poison. And being in the space of surrounding yourself with great people, it is the most important thing. Like you got to do that. And then totally believe in your own shit, invest in your own shit. And if someone tells you you're full of shit, that's a huge gift. Agreed. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. So I think that's great. I'd want to ask you two quick questions, please. Um, Cause this was something I'd heard on one of your podcasts. I think it may have been the Sherm's bagels one, but, uh, but I, I did want to ask you this. So just bringing it to music. I want to wrap it up on music. Mm-hmm. So, Underrated Canadian band. Everybody should be checking out. Personality crisis. Personality crisis. Awesome. Their, L- their LP creatures for a while is like one of the greatest punk hardcore records that's ever. I mean, it's more punk, but I guess you can right. Have yeah. I mean, <laughs> but personality crisis creatures for a while. Second death sentence. Not a pretty sight. Okay, that's awesome. And what is the biggest uh, punk or hardcore record that made an impact on you? Which record made that like? I know it's it's loaded because there's a lot, but like if you had to think of one that was like, wow, that was like hit me between the eyes. Bad brain self-titled. It's a good choice. It's a good choice. Can I give you two more though? Yeah, man. Go ahead. Yeah, give me two more. Uh, but I but I like I like where you're going with this. <laughs> uh minor threat. Well, I don't want to say like minor threat discography because that's gonna I think the minor <laughs> threat the minor threat singles. And then uh, Youth of Today, We're Not in the Salon. Yeah, that's a great one. <laughs> Those are awesome. Cool. Well, awesome. I, I appreciate you, man. This this was this was really, really wonderful. I, I appreciate your time and, and sharing and um, just telling your story. This, this is excellent. And this is exactly what this show is about is, you know, people coming on, sharing, talking about their stories, talking about how they how they're helping others to lift them up and, and, and help them get over the things that they're experiencing in their life. And that's that's the reason why I started this show. Um, way back, which seems like a thousand years ago already, but back last year when when everything was shutting down, I, I said, well, at the very least, what can I do to help people? Well, let me do a platform where they can at least tell their stories and and I can put it out to my network and hopefully you know, that helps them get more business or helps them get some more attention or engagement. So, uh, and since then it's just has grown into you know this this great weekly show now and i have great people like you coming on and, and being able to share your insight and knowledge and experiences with everybody so i am very thankful and very appreciative of that so thank you for coming on hey thanks so much for having me man yeah absolutely and i want to thank everybody out there who is watching this live with us appreciate you all so much thank you thank you to everybody who's watching the replay of this and will be listening to the audio version we will see you next week for another episode of rocket live See ya.